All right, all right, so here we go. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to start covering the thigh. We're going to start covering the femur, all the great muscles that kind of surround the femur. What I will say is that from here on out, this is going to go just like last semester in that we're going to see a lot of patterns. Cool, right? And we saw that in the humerus. We saw that we had patterns with the radial nerve, and we saw patterns with the musculocutaneous nerve. If anyone's going, oh man, what's the radial nerve? Look it up, right? You covered that last semester. And at the same time, understand that for the next couple of units, and the really nice thing I will say about the lower extremity that kind of has an advantage of the upper extremity is that the lower leg, my tibia, fibula area, we do not have nearly the musculature that we have for the upper extremity because that was a beast. That was a true beast. So lower extremity, we're going to have plenty of musculature, but we're not going to have all those different layers of stuff happening. Okay. So when it comes to my femur, femur, I'll be quite honest with you, is a really simple, simple bone. It is as simplistic. Actually, I'll even make an argument. It is more simplistic than the humerus was because the humerus, remember, kind of we have that little bit of angulation that creates the carrying angle and we have the trochlea and the capitulum. Not heads. We, OK, OK, good. Th thank you for acknowledging that we have a trochlea and capitulum. Everyone else was on. Is that on the test? <laughs> what? What? So really what we're going to have here with our femur is we're going to have a really, really, really long shaft. OK, now remember that the femur is a very strong bone. And in fact, femur, based on certain research, based on certain literature, is the strongest bone we have in the body. Femur is a hardcore weight bearing bone. So when I see a patient with a femur fracture, I need to get super concerned. Okay? I have seen one NFL player have a femur fracture. And it was a gruesome injury. Especially start thinking about non-contact injuries. What do I mean by that? Outside of the sports domain, Traumatic contact injuries, false, right? So if I have a patient that snapped their femur because they misstepped, I need to start thinking about something else going on, something metabolic, something systemic, something else going on. The key word that comes right to the top of my head is something like osteoporosis. So I want you to realize that the femur is a very strong bone and realize that clinically if we see really big injuries like a fracture in the femur we may have a serious problem happening now why do i say this because stuff gets missed all the time okay and i can't tell you how many times as a clinician i've picked up on things call up the physician call up the nurse practitioner call up somebody else and say hey Patients showing these signs and symptoms, can we go ahead and get this checked? And I've been right. Now, full disclosure, I've been wrong a whole lot of times too. But when I see something that does not necessarily match the full context of the patient, I need to really investigate it. I need to maybe make a phone call and make a referral because our other healthcare providers and our team are actually really relying on us for information. So in terms of the femur, and we're going to look at the anterior portion here first. I'm going to have a long shaft on my femur, no big deal. And then I'm going to have two condyles. So I'm going to have a medial condyle 
I'm going to have a lateral condyle. The reason that these are important is because what we're going to see is that my medial femoral condyle, my lateral femoral condyle are not going to be equal size. We're going to get into this more when we cover the knee because, and I think you guys may have had an MSK1 question on this about accessory motions at the knee. I remember that question. We're going to get into why that spin happens as an accessory motion. Okay, and the reason is because those condyles are different shaped and different sized. So my lateral condyle, my medial condyle, first off on the anterior side, are just going to provide a large area of articulation between my distal femur and my proximal tibia. Obviously, if this is my medial side over here, then my femoral neck is going to come out. I'm not even going to bother trying to draw a good femur anymore because I'm terrible at it. Stop laughing. Think, think about it this way. When you guys get out of PT school and the first job they ask you, so how's your anatomy instructor? I say, well, I couldn't draw worth a lick, but... <clears throat> But we, but we learned some anatomy. So on the anterior side, what I need to understand is I'm going to have some muscular attachments here. Obviously, what I'm going to see is I see a lot of my hip musculature, pectineus, for example, is going to attach in to that femur on the anterior side. Three out of my four quadriceps muscles are going to have an origin on the femur. Now that be, is going to become very important and we're going to get into this a little later and why two joint muscles are so important. And what we're actually going to see is my two joint muscles end up becoming multi-joint muscles because they're going to move so many different pieces and parts together. So off of my anterior femur, I'm going to have three out of my four quadriceps muscles attached in there. Now, we'll get into the quadriceps a little later. Interesting thing about the quadriceps is that obviously quadriceps means four heads. All four of those heads, much like we saw with biceps brachii, and as we're going to see again with biceps femoris on the posterior thigh, they're all going to come together to form one common tendon. Okay, and that's going to be really important to remember because it's going to be very hard to selectively test each of those quadriceps muscles, right? Because they all come down to one big common tendon. Now, what's really interesting about the quadriceps is that, like I said last week, rectus femoris, that fourth quadricep muscle, because it has an attachment at the AIIS on the pelvis, it's going to be a two joint muscle. And that becomes a big issue because what you need to start thinking about, and you know, being here's a test question, if I'm going to stretch the rectus femoris maximally, what motions will I need to produce for my patient? It's gonna be knee flexion and it's gonna be hip extension. Okay, because the quadricep is going to be the forceful knee extender. So if we stretch it, that's going to be knee flexion, right? And rectus femoris is a hip flexor, which means we need to extend the hip. So this is really where and you guys are going to see this clinically. I can tell if a patient has a short rectus femoris. What I do is I place the patient prone and I perform knee flexion. And what do you guys think happens if I have a short rectus femoris? Say it louder. Their hip moves off the table, AKA they go into hip flexion. Okay, so that's a positive test. So I pull that patient in the knee flexion, 
The rectus femoris is too short to stretch over both joints. It compensates by pulling that hip into flexion. Okay, so it's a really easy test. Put them in knee flexion, it pops up. Yep, that's a positive test. I have a tight rectus femoris there. So this is why you need to understand these attachments because you can do really easy, efficient things in the clinic that can get you a really good diagnosis really quickly if you just understand how the anatomy is put together. Okay, so like I said, there's not a ton on the anterior femur. Posterior femur's got a couple more things. It's not, it, honestly, the femur, in my opinion, is kind of a boring bone. There's <laughs> not, not a ton going on there. So posterior side, and I'm going to try to draw in the proximal section because I'm terrible at it. One big line of demarcation that we're going to see on the posterior side is going to be this linea aspera. So this yellow thing is the linea aspera. And all that linea aspera is, is going to be just a section of the posterior femur that almost looks like someone took the bone and pinched it up. Like if you took a piece of paper and just pinched it up, you're just going to have this large area where it just kind of comes up to a little bit of a point. What we're going to see is we're going to see a lot of muscle attachment come off that linea aspera. So just be aware of that. that that's where that linea aspera is. The posterior side also has a lot of muscle attachment that happens at the distal aspect. And one muscle that we're going to cover here is going to be another two joint muscle. And what we're going to see is we're going to see two areas of roughening at the posterior distal femur. And that's where a muscle called gastrocnemius is going to attach. AKA the calf muscle, right? We're not going to call it calf muscle in here because calves are baby cows. Gastrocnemius is in the human body. Now, again, this is going to be another two joint muscle, right? So if gastrocnemius attaches to my distal femur, what action would it have? at the knee. Knee flexion. It has a very minor amount of knee flexion. This is a big reason why, for those of you who worked in clinics as techs or observed or whatever, you may see a patient do a slant board stretch, an incline stretch, right? I've seen that one. Who here has seen that patient do the slant board stretch with knees extended and with knees flexed? Pretty common. Why is that? The soleus. So why would the knee bent incline stretch stretch the soleus? Put slack in the gastroc. And the soleus doesn't have an attachment across the knee. It's a one joint muscle. Okay, so that's why Number one, you see that slant board stretch sometimes happening with a knee extended and a knee bent or flex. Yes? I may have missed it, but did you say um, the spots where the gastroc inserts or the originates? Is there a name for that or just posterior? It's just posterior distal femur. If you look at Gray's, it says attachment for the gastroc. <laughs> so you're like, on a lab exam, if I colored that in, it would be attachment for the gastroc. Not that I would ever do something like that. No. Let's <laughs> put so this way, I wouldn't do it today. What's that? No. <laughs> so the other thing, again, this is where we're going to get into a lot of two joint muscles. 
If I'm going to maximally stretch out gastrocnemius, I'm going to perform knee extension and dorsiflexion. We're going to do dorsiflexion here in a couple weeks. Okay, so those are kind of the basics coming off of the osteology of the posterior femur. All right, this is going to look super duper familiar to what you guys went over with Dr. Fox yesterday, right? Who here loves anatomy circles? Why are anatomy circles important? One more time. It tells you the prime movers. There's actually a more simplistic reason why anatomy circles are important. They're a shortcut. They're a huge shortcut. Okay, and shortcuts are not a bad thing. But really what the anatomy circle is, is just cross-sectional anatomy with a little bit of trigonometry added on. That's it. So when we take a cross-section of the thigh, again, this is going to look a lot like that anatomy circle. We're going to see very similar patterning that we saw with the humerus, that we saw with radius and ulna, several different parts of the body. Now, what I will tell you with cross-sectional anatomy, and we're going to get into this way more next year, just like the humerus, if I see one bone in the cross-sectional anatomy, I know I'm in the thigh. If I see two bones, I know I'm in the lower leg, right? Because if I chop off tib fib, I'm going to see straight down, and I'm going to see tib, and I'm going to see fib. I don't have two bones. Now, this becomes very important when you start looking at CT scans, because a lot of those CT scans are going to be done in the axial plane. So they're actually going to be cross sectional anatomy. This is also very important because for those of you who are going to dry needle people, you need to know where you are in terms of all the little reference points of that cross-sectional anatomy. So coming straight off the posterior aspect of the femur is going to be something called an intramuscular septa. And what we're going to have is we're going to have a medial intramuscular septa and a lateral intramuscular septa. Now, what this is going to create is this is going to create some compartments. I'm also going to have another compartment that kind of comes off this direction. So the thigh is going to have three major compartments. I'm going to see an anterior compartment. I'm going to see a medial compartment. And I'm going to see a posterior compartment. Now, what's really interesting about quadriceps especially, and you can kind of see it in this picture up here at the very, very top, is that whole thing is the quadricep. And what I want you to really recognize and kind of appreciate is the fact how much that quadricep wraps around the femur. Just about all of it. Right? It is a big old muscle and it almost envelops that entire femur. So that's another big great advantage that the quadriceps has is that it gives a lot of support. It gives a, it, if we think about my quadricep as a shock absorber, that's going to provide a lot of shock absorption. I can do a lot of stuff there. And just happens to be 
the most powerful knee flexor I have. Or I'm sorry, knee extender that I have. Now, this is where the patterning comes in. So in my anterior portion, what I'm going to see here is I'm going to have my hip flexors. I'm going to have my knee extenders. All of these guys are going to be innervated by the femoral nerve and they're all going to get blood from the femoral artery. So this is where the shortcut comes in. So if I'm looking at a lab exam and I only got a minute to figure out what I'm doing in the lab exam and there's a tag and it's popped into vastus intermedius and it says what's the innervation for this muscle that one should be putting the ball on the tee for you, right? Because I know I'm in the anterior compartment. It's going to be the femoral nerve. So just understand how the patterning is going to work, just like we saw with the humerus last semester. My posterior compartment is going to be my hip extenders. my knee flexors, which are going to pretty much share the same muscle, right? Because that's going to be quote unquote my hamstrings. My sciatic nerve is going to innervate all that stuff. And my deep femoral artery is going to provide the blood. My medial side, these are going to be where my AD ductors live. The obturator nerve is going to supply the innervation. And the obturator artery is going to supply the blood. Yes. This is actually called the deep fascia or the deep investing fascia. So this little line here is just called the deep fascia. I think at this point in time, the original anatomist got bored and they stopped naming things. So they just called it deep fascia. It's got, yeah, exactly. Towards the end of the day, right? You know, like I said, you know, Ed told Chuck, it's like, what do you want to call us? I don't care. I just want to go home. All right, deep fascia, check. We're good. Mm -hmm. Not like acetabulum, where you know you could tell like acetabulum was like the first one they tagged for the day. It was like, ooh, let's call this vinegar cup. That would be fun. <laughs> like you know, they're full of energy. Probably got to go off vacation somewhere. Oh, they were totally on a time clock. Yeah, there's there's a there's a very good book about the history of cadavers out there that I would, if you ever get a chance, I'd highly recommend reading. So again, anatomy circles, this is where the biomechanics gets placed on top of this cross-sectional anatomy. All these anatomy circles are, are basically just moment arms and vectors, okay? So in your biomechanics class, don't freak out too much about anatomy circles because that's really all it is. Just understand where those little arrows go. Just understand what each of those muscles are actually going to do. Okay. Is everybody good with this picture? Is anyone not good with this picture? All right. So next thing I wanted to cover was going to be this tensor fascia lata muscle in the IT band. Now, big thing about tensor fascia lata, if we regraze 
and we look at the action slash function of tensor fascia lata, it says it stabilizes the knee in an extended position. How it does that is through a very long piece of connective tissue called the iliotibial band. Now, what I will say, the iliotibial band says what it is, and it is what it says. It's a band that goes from my ilium to my tibia. That's it. Okay. The iliotibial band itself is non contractile tissue. And this is why clinically this is a big difference. So who here in the clinic through observation hours, tech work, whatever it is, has seen a therapist say, you know what, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to start digging on that IT band. I'm going to start working on that IT band, right? I'm going to really stretch that IT band. Maybe, maybe not. What do you guys know about the rates of healing for different tissues? Are all tissues, do they all heal at the same rate, right? What's the function? What really dictates how fast the tissue heals? Vascularity, exactly. AKA, how much oxygen can I get into that tissue? That's why bone takes so much longer to heal than a tendon does. That's why tendon takes longer to heal than muscle does. That's why muscle takes longer to heal than skin does, right? Slice my arm open, it's going to be pretty well healed in about a week, right? Slice my quad open, eh, it could be a while, right? Snap my femur in half, I'll see you next year, right? Until it's fully, fully healed. So this is something I want you to consider because you guys are going to get into extracts prescription here in the summer. I cannot contract my IT band without my TFL. Okay. And the reason I say this is because I've seen clinically so many times people are taking rollers and all sorts of stuff to the IT band and just go into town on the IT band. What are you really trying to do to that IT band? Besides just beat the daylights out of it. Right? And you take all these rollers and these foam things and lacrosse balls and you know. What you have to think about is what's the goal of that, right? If the goal is tissue healing, how much tissue healing am I gonna have if I don't have a good oxygen supply? Eh. Now there's something to be said for, you know, breaking up adhesions and breaking up cross fibers and all the stuff that happens after an injured tissue goes through the healing process. But don't forget about where that IT band attaches. Don't forget about tensor fascia lata and all those things. The other thing is, think about this. And this is where tensor fascia lata gets a little tricky. If we get real technical about it, is tensor fascia lata a one joint muscle or is it a two joint muscle? Two. Yeah. Okay, so TFL is going to be a two joint muscle. So it's going to cross my hip and it's going to cross my knee. So how would you propose that we stretch TFL? Would a deduction be a fair way to do it? Could be. Okay. Would putting the patient into a ton of genu varus and just gapping the lateral side of their knee and whatever happens, happens, be a good way to do it? It might have some dire consequences, but it would stretch it. It might rupture it, but it would stretch it. Right? 
but understand again why we do some of these stretches right so think about what are some good it band stretches right we saw patients do an it band stretch what are they going to do don't they usually do something that looks like this number what am i doing here i'll show you guys over here place my hip into extension right and then i lean the opposite side what relative motion is happening here at my hip Who's voting for flexion? Who's voting for a deduction? Who's voting for a deduction? Who's voting for a deduction? All right, good. A deduction. Good call. Okay. Even though I'm not technically moving my femur, relative motion is I'm a deducting my hip. Okay. In other words, what am I doing to the iliac crest? where that IT band and TFL attach into. I'm pulling them farther away from their insertion. Okay, that's a really big point to remember. You want to stretch a muscle, take the origin, take the insertion, pull them apart. That's essentially what you're doing. And that becomes very difficult sometimes with muscles like piriformis because it's hotly debated, how do I stretch piriformis? Just take the insertion, take the origin, and pull them apart. As long as you're doing that, you're going to stretch it. Sometimes, sometimes it's a simple answer. All right, everybody good with this picture? Anybody not good? Anybody want to call it the, for the day? Okay, all right, about 25 more minutes, we'll go ahead and call it. I, I know, I'm being generous, being generous. So. Here's the next concept, okay? And this is going to be a concept that we covered a tiny, tiny bit in last semester's content. We're going to cover it a lot more this semester. You guys are definitely going to see this again in other coursework, aka exercise prescription and MSK. One of the big surprises that students have for exercise prescription is how much manual they learn in exercise prescription and it's a big shock because you're like well it's exercise prescription like we should be doing like squats and dumbbell presses and all sorts of things and you do joint mobilizations because what's the definition of exercise movement of a joint so does that include when the therapist moves a patient's joint for them who's seen passive range of motion done is that technically an exercise? Kind of, sort of, yeah. Because if we just define exercise as movement, I'm providing movement. Is it active exercise? No. Is it passive exercise? Yes. Another under the umbrella term exercise is the concept of joint mobilization. Okay, so what is a joint mobilization? You guys have gone over this a little bit in MSK with some of these accessory motions, All right? Have you guys gone over R1, R2 yet? What's that? Okay, one through five. So Colton Bourne's and Maitland's system and all that stuff, right? So all that's a system for joint mobilization. When you're performing joint mobilizations, what you want to do is you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, right? I want to get the biggest reward for the least amount of work. How I do that is I place the joint in a position where all of the tissue is in the most amount of slack. Okay, so what is open packed? When I said open pack position, open pack equals most space in the joint or joints on slack. In the hip, that becomes very important because go back to about a week ago when we started talking about 
the iliofemoral ligament and the ischiofemoral ligament and pubofemoral ligament. Right? Okay. Those ligaments, I would argue, one comes off and goes to the anterior portion of the hip, one goes to the posterior portion of the hip, one goes to the inferior portion of the hip. Cool. What I need to think about, because we already talked about this, which hip motion is going to put the iliofemoral ligament on stretch? If it's the anterior portion, it should be extension, right? So iliofemoral ligament comes off anterior. I mean, that's a wide ligament of big low. If I put that bone, that joint in extension, I'm going to stretch or put on a tensile force onto my iliofemoral ligament. Ischiofemoral ligament, it's going to be on stretch with flexion, right? Pubofemoral ligament, it's going to be on stretch with abduction. Now, what I can do is I can put each of those ligaments in a little bit of a slack position by placing the joint in what we call the 30-30-30 position. And each, every joint's going to have a different position where there's an open pack position and a closed pack position. For the hip, that's going to be 30 degrees flexion. 30 degrees abduction and 30 degrees of lateral or external rotation. Excuse me. So what I need to understand when I'm performing a joint mobilization on a patient, okay, and I'm going to layer on, get ready, convex concave on top of this. The lack of enthusiasm is a little concerning. I'm going to layer on Arthur Kinematics, convex concave on top of this. There we go. <laughs> as forced as that was, I still appreciate it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's that's like, wow, <laughs> that was that was bad. That's okay. So when I'm performing a joint mobilization, what I have to understand is that I am going to push on that joint, right? Who's seen a therapist do a joint mobilization in the clinic? Okay, what do they do? They sit there and they just start pushing on the joint. Is that therapist affecting the roll? or the slide, the slide, exactly. So here's what I need to think about. This is where the arthrokinematics become very important. I'm gonna place that joint in its respective open pack position. For the hip, that's 30 degrees flexion, 30 degrees abduction, 30 degrees lateral rotation. I'm then going to determine which slide I need to perform in order to get the goal that I want, in order to get the result that I want. So if I am performing an inferior or inferiorly directed joint mobilization, in other words, I'm pushing straight down on that hip or on that femur, what motion am I trying to improve? Abduction, okay? Because abduction has what sort of arthrokinematic property? Superior roll, inferior glide. Superior roll, inferior glide. Okay, so all you're doing is just reversing that concept. All you're doing is just reversing that equation. So 
if I if I know that a deduction has superior rule inferior slide and I'm performing inferior slide, I am trying to improve deduction. OK, all right, we'll do another one. I put my patient in the open pack position, my 30, 30, 30. I provide a posteriorly directed force. I push straight back towards the buttock. What motion am I trying to improve? Hip flexion, okay? Hip flexion, okay? Because what is the arthrokinematic pairing of hip flexion? Anterior roll, posterior slide, okay? So if I have performed hip flexion, anterior roll, posterior slide. Remember, if I'm doing joint mobilization, I'm affecting the slide. OK, if I'm sitting there doing passive range of motion on a person, and I'm just sitting there cranking their femur, talking about the weekend. I'm affecting roll and slide, right, because they're going through the full motion. If I'm simply pushing down on that patient, I'm affecting the slide. OK, so my recommendation is as you guys are starting going through all of these joint mechanics and the hip is a good one to start with with that concept because it can only do a couple things, right? It only has a couple degrees of freedom. Once we start, yes. Um, arthro kinematics happen regardless of chain, right? So arthro kinematics are going to happen. That's just an osteological motion, and it's going to happen closed chain versus open chain. Now the difference will be is what is moving on what. OK, and I'll just go ahead and we'll go through it real quickly. Let's think about this. OK, so if I'm open chain, this is going to become fun because we're going to cover something in the knee called the screw home mechanism. OK, I'm going to argue open chain. Cool. Needs to be the extension. Cool. Is my femur moving or is my tibia moving? My tibia. All right, but I'm performing the extension in flexion. Closed chain. My tibia is not moving nearly as much. I'm moving a little bit. I'm performing the extension in flexion. What's moving? My femur, not my tibia. Now that's going to become a big, big concept when we start covering the screw home mechanism. And the screw home mechanism is exactly what that spin is. OK, so that accessory motion in the knee of spin. Because the condyles at the femur and the condyles at the tibia, the tibial plateaus are misshapen and asymmetrical, there's a little bit of a torsion, a little bit of a transverse plane motion that happens. OK, so despite the fact that the knee is a pretty straight line joint, there's just a tiny bit of transverse plane motion that happens. OK. All right, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead. Let's cut it here for the day.